world building, character arcs, plot points, themes, tones. Long ago, these storytelling elements came together in harmony in one glorious show. Then, everything changed when Shyamalan adapted it. Only Netflix could bring the original creators together for a possible revival. But when the fans needed them most, they bailed. Years passed, then One Piece came out, proving that the network might actually know what they're doing. And although Netflix has a lot of great adaptations, they have a huge fan base in Avatar with some very high expectations. But I believe Netflix can pull it off. Hey, this is the Sword in the Pen Reflections. It is my casual alternative to another channel up there with only three videos and then one in the editing bay with a bunch of copyright blocks. But anyway, we are here to talk about Avatar The Last Airbender and adapting themes from the animated series into the live action. The first thing we need to do is define what a theme is. And this is a very broad subject, but the main idea is this. A theme is a subject that your story is going to touch on or explore or demonstrate, showcase, whatever, in some way. It can be anything from a moral lesson to an observation of the world or some something. It's, it's so broad. But you can also have a repeating pattern, like a motif, something in your story that comes up over and over again, and that's considered a theme too. And I'm gonna talk about both in this video, but really the bulk of it is going to be that first one. Because theme is not plot, world, or character specific, it's one of the easiest things to write from scratch. You wanna show the pettiness of generational prejudice? There are endless ways to explore it. Avatar did it with the Great Divide, but we could have had warring families in Ba Sing Se, or maybe Mei's family had a long ago falling out with Zuko's family, and now Mei and Zuko are sort of the Romeo and Juliet of the Fire Nation with a happy ending. They didn't do that and that's fine, creator's prerogative. I'm anticipating that the live action will get criticized for being less valuable if it leaves out any themes or dimensions of themes when it has to cut out characters or plots that were vehicles through which these themes were delivered. But because the live action is also going to do some expansion, it's likely that we'll see new themes and new depths of themes. Depending on how well it's done, it is totally possible for there to be an even or pretty even trade. Now, on the flip side of theme being easy to write from scratch, adapting can be another story. If you have to cut a plot or character that had a specific theme that it carried, it can be damned near impossible to reintegrate that theme in some other way. That's because themes are naturally brought forth through the world building characters, plot, all that good stuff. You're gonna hear me say it several times in this video that I have to talk about certain themes when I'm discussing particular character arcs because they just go hand in hand and you can't really separate the two. In the best storytelling, you will never have to be directly told what the theme is. We'll just notice it because it is integral to the particular character or plot that it's attached to. And as I implied in a previous video, the best stories are often perfect combinations of plot, character arcs, world building themes, and tones. They are all dependent on each other to work really, really well. Now, integrating or reintegrating a theme where it didn't exist before can make it stick out awkwardly, just too obviously. It's just bad storytelling. Rather than go too much into it, I'm gonna tell you to go watch Savage Books' fantastic video on political messaging in Avatar. I really can't say it better than he does. And be sure to check out his other creative writing videos. They are spot on and he has a great voice. But my conclusion at the end of this is if a theme or dimension of a theme is lost when a plot or character is cut, don't try to force it in somewhere else that it wasn't already. Okay, for example, let's say that the live action adaptation does have to cut out all the plot and characters that brought forth the theme of sexism which I guess would completely eliminate the whole Katara arc up at the North Pole, which is why it's completely obvious to me that there's no way that's going to get cut. But yeah, so if all that's cut and we still want to put the sexism in, where would we put it? Would we put it into Toph's conflict with her parents? 
uh, that conflict is about the struggles of having a disability and overprotective and distant helicopter parents. Okay, would we put sexism into the conflict with Azula and her trying to fit in at the party on Ember Island? It's not exactly an essential plot, but let's just say we're doing it there. There is no freaking way anyone would believe Azula would find sexism to be even a remotely concerning obstacle. True power, the divine right to rule, is something you're born with. The fact is, they don't know which one of us is going to be sitting on that throne, and which one is going to be bowing down. But I know, and you know. Well... You've beaten me at my own game. Don't flatter yourself. You were never even a player. Her struggle is fitting into normal social situations. That has absolutely nothing to do with sexism. So here's the thing I think fans who really love all the themes that the original show touched on are going to find hard to swallow. When certain plots and characters have to be cut, whatever themes or dimensions of themes that were attached to those plot or characters, they have to be cut too. And it would be better if the adaptation didn't try to force them in elsewhere. But as I also said, there is the possibility that we'll get some new depths and dimensions on themes and new themes altogether because we are going to have to see some expansion. This is all just a small part of a much larger discussion on presenting themes and stories. And for this video, I just want to go through Avatar and talk about its themes. I'm going to be breaking this down looking at themes that stretch across the entirety of season one of the animated series and what I think should be put into season one of the live action series. So for Avatar season one, I came up with five really big themes that had a lot of sub themes and oh my gosh, it was endless. There's so many. So the biggest and most obvious overarching theme, so this is like kind of bleeds into every little subplot, is war and its effects. I do think that this is something that has to be amplified in the live action because it was barely there in the animation. We had three instances where we saw him mourning or directly being affected by the genocide of his people. I mean, remember that two days before he wakes up, he thought he he thought that two days before he was uh, with his family. Now they're all dead and not just dead, they're killed dead, which is a different level of dead. It's like a more extreme level of dead. Somebody did this to them. When he's in the battleship with Katara, when he discovers the body of Monk Gyatso, and in the episode called The Storm. And the rest of the time, we see almost no evidence of this weight on him. I, even across the entire series, there's only a couple of instances. We, we really see it when he clings to Appa. So I love that scene where we see Aang hugging Appa in the trailer of the live action, because I hope that that is one of those moments where we see that this is all he has left. Appa is the only other piece of his past, of his family that is still there. But yeah, so I think we need to see more of this weight on him, this knowledge of, first of all, this mourning, um, but more of the weight of your people are all dead and killed and you're the last one. Otherwise, it's just gonna look like he didn't care. Gosh, I wanna talk about this so much more, but I just don't have time in this video. Then we've got imperialism, and this is a, another subcategory of war and its effects. And this is explored in so many ways. We see uh, the xenophobia of the Southern Water Tribe. Like they are fearful of anybody, even a 12 year old boy who is an airbender. They're like afraid that he might be a spy for the Fire Nation. And that's what happens when your people have in so to some degree, there's been a genocide of the Southern Water Tribe as well. All of their waterbenders were taken away and presumably dead now. They were, well, we find out through Hama that they were imprisoned and, but imprisoned for life, you know, the, where are they? She escaped and she's the only one we know about. Anyway, unless it's talked about in the comics or something. I haven't read any of the comics. I've watched the animated series for the Aang arc like more times than I can count, but I only saw Korra once. Then we have in the Imprisoned episode, which is one of my favorite episodes uh, because of all the different degrees of being an oppressed people that we see. So you have the fear in Haru and his mother that he will be found out. Then we have this wonderful thing with the old man that he rescues, turning him in. 
Like that, that's something that you rare, you, I don't think you would ever see this in like a children's cartoon, but it, it was great. I loved it. So the old man, it's never really clarified what his motives were, but it's probably one of two things. Either one, he was secretly in an alliance with the Fire Nation, like he had some sort of a, a you know, he, he wanted the Fire Nation there and he wanted the Fire Nation to, to be in charge. Or two, he was so scared of what the consequences would be if it was ever found out that he knew of an earthbender and didn't tell anybody that he had to turn, that he felt he had to turn in Haru, um, which is great because this is something that, I mean, gosh, the conflict in that is so good. Uh, you know, that you can't trust your neighbor because they may be so afraid that they're willing to turn on you. And then we have the psychology of the prisoners who are on the prison ship. And I really love this too, because it explores something so interesting. And that is the, the psychological impact of having no hope for a very long time. There's a book called A Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. And he was a psychologist who was a prisoner in, I believe it was Auschwitz. And he was allowed to take notes while he was a prisoner. And the things he observed are, are just fascinating um, just regarding psychology. So one of the things that he, that I remember very specifically was that when the war was over essentially and the gates of Auschwitz were open and there were no prison guards, all of the prisoners left the prison, went out into the villages where everybody's like celebrating that the war is over, but they felt nothing and they came back to the prison camp because, well, first of all, they had nowhere to go, but like that they just came back and he observed that nobody had any feeling of elation or uh, even a sense of we are free because they had been so psychologically damaged from everything that had happened that they weren't even capable of feeling that. So I love that we saw in the on the prison ship that when Katara acquires coal for the earthbenders, it's like the weapon of freedom is at their feet and they can't even bring themselves to believe that they can do anything about it. Like, even though it's right there in front of them, they just can't do anything. I, oh, so good. But the thing that does inspire them or does, does reignite that fire in them is one of their children being put in danger. Oh, it's just so good. I just love that scene. But anyway, I wish we would see all of these things in the animated series, but I have had to think to myself, where would you stick this? And how essential is it to the big plot of get the gang to the North Pole? I don't think it's super, super important to that story. It is, however, something that I think Katara, we need to see this drive to be an inspirer of hope. We see that happen a couple of times in the series. And this is like the first really big moment for Katara. So I don't know if they're going to try to have a moment like this for her somewhere else, but it'll be a tricky one. I mean, there's so many things you could do that I, gosh, I should probably try to brainstorm. I did not get to the point where I was brainstorming what you could do instead when I was scripting this, but I'm sure that there's something that you could do. Maybe if you have ideas, put it in the comments. Let's assume we can't do the imprisoned episode. How might you squeeze that somewhere else in season one? Please like, subscribe, and comment, even if it's just with an emoji. It's a free way to support the channel. Or if you're feeling really generous, check out my Patreon, Ko-fi, or hit the Money Heart Thanks button. You can even leave me a one-time tip. Information is in the description and below. The last sub-theme of War and Its Effects is conflict resolution, and this is really important for Aang's big arc across all three books, um, because he gets to the end of book three, and he doesn't know, how am I going to defeat the Fire Lord without killing him? But conflict resolution comes up so many times throughout the entire series. We see it just about any time that the kids are squabbling with each other. Forgiveness is something that we see come up a few times. Getting over the anger of being hurt is another big one. We see both of those things covered in the Bato of the Water Tribe episode when Katara and Sokka forgive and put aside their hurt feelings to support uh, Aang. But the biggest sub-theme of conflict resolution, I think, is probably revenge. Uh, it's such a it, it, to me, this is always a really fascinating subject in uh, East Asian literature because I think that there's a there's there are conflicting philosophies, a drive for revenge that 
this is the only way to rec to acquire justice. And then the conf the conflict being that if you are taking revenge, what's to stop the other side from taking revenge on you for your revenge? And then the cycle just continues on and on forever. So, you know, the conflict being like forgiveness is necessary to end this. Mercy is necessary to end this. It seems most prevalent, I think, though, in Jet's story. So Jet we see as this revolutionary, right? Because he's a freedom fighter and he's going to liberate the valley. And, you know, he's this charismatic, noble, uh, you know, underdog who is actually making a difference until we realize that is his tool for manipulation. You know, his charisma and his flattery is all part of him getting people to do what he wants. And he's on a mission of revenge. He will ta attack an old man who's no threat at all. He will wipe out an entire town just because they are firebenders, women and children, you know, everybody included, and it's just wrong. So it's a, a criticism of revenge. So I thought this was playing really well into an East, a very common East Asian theme. And so I'd love to see that in here. I know in the live action, I know that we see Jet in the trailer. And so I'm assuming that we're going to see this come up in some way. I actually think that this is going to be part of the masks episode for some reason, because Jet is not who he seems, right? Maybe it'll be in that Into the Dark episode. Like, we are now getting into the darker stuff in this show. Which, if that ends up being the <laughs> the, the secret tunnel of two lovers, like, if, that, if that ends up being that episode, that'll be fun. Even though that's a season two episode. It, Toph's not in it, so why not have it in season one? I do want to mention two other sub themes of um, of war and its effects, specifically conflict resolution, and that is valor as an honorable trait. I love that Sokka in C in episode two stands up to Zuko's warship. I absolutely adore that moment. Um, so I'm really hoping that we see that in the live action because I think it speaks to Sokka's valor so well, and it, this is why I think he is like the perfect choice for the leader of the gang, you know, that he has this instinct in him to do the right thing. And we see it come up again in the Jet episode where he puts himself on the line going to warn the village that you guys are gonna be wiped out, you know? So anyway, and the other sub theme is uh, looking at your enemy and asking if this war wasn't going on, would we have been friends? Which of course is the line that Aang says to Zuko in the end of the uh, Blue Spirit episode. And we see this come up a few times throughout the series um, where we're introduced to Fire Nation people who are not bad. And then we're also introduced to non-Fire Nation people. So waterbenders, remember bloodbending, and uh, earthbenders who are bad. Actually, Jet's not an earthbender. I'm trying to think of a bad earthbender. Well, I mean, everything that happened in Bossing Se was pretty messed up. <laughs> so I think that all counts. Okay, that's it. I got to put aside conflict resolution and war and its effects. Like, I, there are so many things I didn't mention, but I can't. Anyway, the next overarching theme uh, that I think should be included in season one is the, um, the choice between what is good for the individual versus what is good for the world. And... This is the one where I'm going to mention a stylistic theme that has been nicely woven into this because we see this theme most prevalently in Zuko and Aang. And several times throughout the show, we saw that even in the editing of the animation, they, they cut back and forth between Aang and Zuko doing certain things. And I loved that because their storylines move parallel to each other. So I have this thing that I've termed parallel mirroring. And I don't know if it's actually a thing in writing. Like I've looked it up and I can't find nothing about it, but mirroring is a real thing in writing. So mirroring is a tool that as a writer you use to show the similarities and differences of certain things. You'll have, it's typical, here's just an example, and you can do this in many different ways, but you have something that happens at one point in your story and then it happens again later on. And maybe the circumstances are slightly different or maybe the, uh, the, the thing that happens is slightly different, but it's done like this so that you can be at this second point and go, 
it's different from how it was there. Or maybe it's the same, but everything else around it is different. And so your perspective of it is different. Um, but parallel mirroring is where you have a whole storyline that sort of parallels somebody else's storyline in your series. So Zuko's storyline and Aang's storyline are like this through almost the entire series. They are right next to each other, moving along each other, but in an oddly opposite directions sort of thing. In season one's episode, The Storm, you're cutting back and forth between Zuko's past and Aang's past and uh, Zuko's present situation and Aang's present situation. Even their storylines are pretty similar in there um, as far as, you know, mirroring each other, going in opposite directions. You've got Zuko so eager to be part of the war meeting, and you've got Aang so eager to not be the Avatar, to step away from that role, and both of them suffering because of how they handle the situation. In season two, you've got Bitter Work, which is a top-notch episode in my book. You're cutting back and forth between Zuko and Aang, both struggling to learn a new style of bending, one that's hard for them to learn. In Aang's case, he actually does attain learning how to earthbend, but in Zuko's case, he doesn't actually get to do the thing that he probably learns how to do, and he actually learns it without too much difficulty. He wasn't able to shoot lightning, but he was able to learn how to redirect it. He doesn't even get to t get tested for it, but we can see that he really understands this one. And interestingly enough, Zuko learns the technique that is his elemental opposite. It's water, he's fire. Remember, Iroh said that he developed this technique while studying the waterbenders. And for Aang, he's learning earthbending, which is the elemental opposite of air. And in the third season, you've got both Aang and Zuko learning about their ancestors. Well, in Aang's case, it's his past life. Roku and Fire Lord Sozin being friends growing up together and everything that happened between them. They're both learning about this at the same time. But we can't talk about that because we're on, on season one right now. We need to see Zuko on his way to making that choice from I want to do what is right by my father's standards, which in his mind is the world, right? And moving towards focusing on himself. And I will get more into that theme in when I discuss Zuko's character arc, because it's just so woven into that. Um, but at the same time, we need to see Aang making the opposite journey. So he is trying to just be a kid and just be himself. Like that's what he Maybe he's not even trying. He's that's what he wants. That's what he's always wanted. That's the reason he left the the air nomads. You know, he he needed to get away from like the I'm the Avatar, and he just wanted to be a kid again. But he needs to be moving towards. I have to grow up fast. I need to set aside my own wants, my my own needs for what is good for the world. But at the same time, he has to do what's good for him. Like, oh, it's so complex, I love it. Anyway, I don't think I can talk too much more about this particular overarching theme without getting really into the character arcs of Aang and Zuko. So I'm gonna save that for my character arcs episode. But it is a big overarching theme, and I really hope that they, that they exemplify the fact that the two characters have these parallel lines that are sort of moving in opposite directions, because it was great as a stylistic theme in the show. And I feel like it was underused. I mean, it was used and I was so happy that it was used. To me as a writer, I was like, brilliant, but I don't think it was so obvious to everybody else. And you could maybe amp that up a smidge. And I think that would be fine. I don't think you're gonna destroy the artistic value by making it less subtle, but I'd love to see that it happens in the live action. Next big overarching theme is family. What is family? And this includes found family. And um, you see this a lot with the dynamic between Katara and Sokka and Aang, and then of course, between Zuko and Iroh and his father. Uh, even though we don't see them together in the first season in the animated series, you know, the Zuko, Iroh, and the father, like father's not there. The father is a presence in Zuko all the time. Anytime that he talks about his honor, what he's really talking about is getting back into my father's good graces, earning his love back, which you shouldn't have to earn, which is what Iroh teaches him. But okay, so sub themes for family, and I'm going to touch on just a few of them. Oh my gosh, it's so hard to not talk about everything. One of the first themes is that family will want what is best for you. And Iroh is the embodiment of this. Uh, everything that he does 
for Zuko is for Zuko. It's not to support his mission of capturing the Avatar, although we see him, you know, take part in Zuko's plans. His main focus is, I love my nephew and I just want what's best for him. And Zuko's struggle is seeing that as a family quality, seeing that as something that a father should be. And at the end of season one in the animated series, we have that beautiful moment that could be more beautiful, I think, between Zuko and Iroh when Zuko is setting off to infiltrate the Northern Water Tribe and Iroh starts tearing up because he tells him, I've always thought of you as my own son. And Zuko saying, you don't have to say that. I, I think I, if this was mine, if this was my book or my show, I, I would try to lead up to Zuko having that realization a little bit better. Not realization, but you know, him being more aware of it uh, sooner. But I don't know how you could do that. I'd have to sit and think about it a whole lot more. And I was only halfway through my script for this video when I decided to can it. So I didn't get to explore this bit, but there's gotta be some stuff that you could do to kind of amplify this one a little bit more. Maybe after the assassination attempt on uh, Zuko, Zuko, who we know is injured, we can have a moment where we see Iroh caring for him, or maybe we see Iroh find him or you know whatever. I don't know, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of things you could do. Okay, we're gonna have to t discuss this in more depth when we look at the Zuko arc uh, in my character arcs video, but I uh, I gotta move aside from this, but it just is so beautiful. I just love this. Anyway, okay, with Katara and Sokka and Aang, I'm pretty sure just from the dialogue that we got in uh, the, the trailer that we're going to see Aang coming to a realization that Katara and Sokka are his family now. And you know, he ta says that they're his friends, but they're his found family. And we saw it in, um, in the animated series in episode three, where they're at the Southern Air Temple. And Katara says, we are your family now. Like, we will be here for you. I really, I hope that line is still there because I think it's very important. And I think that it's just important for the overall story. If we're going to amplify Aang's arc in realizing that he doesn't have to be alone, like make that a thing for him, that he's kind of overwhelmed with the idea of being the avatar and the the the, the realization that he's not alone is the thing that, that uh, gives him what he needs in order to accept that major role. Like, I'm not doing this alone. I, I like that. I think that's great. We want to really amplify and continue to have present this, um, their found family. They, they are there for each other. They only want what is best for each other. And that kind of feeds into my second sub theme for this family theme, which is recognizing your role as the supportive one. And um, that is definitely Katara and Sokka. There are a lot of times in the first season where we see the two of them putting aside their own wants for Aang's needs. Um, they leave the Southern Water Tribe to go and rescue Aang, and then they don't go home in order to take him to the Northern Water Tribe. And when they when they find uh, Bato in the Bato of the Water Tribe, they're, they know that their father is nearby and there's a note coming with a map to where their father is. They could meet up with him and see him again, but it would mean detouring from getting up to the Northern Water Tribe and Aang hides it from them. And they're so angry at him for this and that they leave. They're like, we're not part of this. And, you know, we don't, we can't forgive you for you doing this to us, for this lying. So they see it as a betrayal. But then they come to the realization that he needs us and we are his family. And so they go back to, to rescue Aang. It ends up being a reverse rescue. <laughs> but you get the idea. They realize their role as family to Aang and that they have to put aside the thing that they want most to be reunited with their father in order to be there for Aang because this is what Aang needs and he is the avatar and he's all alone in the world and they have accepted this role as his family. It's funny then we have the opposite happening with Zuko and Iroh in this case because Zuko does not recognize that Iroh is that person in his life, the one who is doing the things that are best for him, putting aside, well, he doesn't really have to put anything aside because he's enlightened. <laughs> um, but Uncle Iroh 
is the person who is his family and he just can't recognize that because he's looking towards his father as, you know, my father is the one who I should be pleasing, you know. He doesn't recognize when somebody sees him, truly sees him as family. Gosh, I love the family theme in this whole series. And I know that it's going to be focused on a live action. You just can't get around it. And also just all the dialogue that we heard, it's definitely going to be there as part of Aang's big arc. And with it being such a big thing in the Zuko and Iroh story, it's gonna be there. And gosh, and it is the heart. I mean, the theme is kind of the soul of the story, but this is so close to the heart of the story as well. Like if you nail this, I think if you nail that that they are family, it's gonna feel a lot like in One Piece. Like One Piece is a found family story. I mean, oh my gosh, the gang coming together to support Nami, to fight for Nami to help her. Gosh, what a wonderful emotional moment and a great finale for the first season. It really shows that this was the big theme of the entire series was they are family and you are there for family. Even when they push you away and push you away and push you away, when they ask for help, you help them. Like, oh, I love it. Hmm. I, I want that in Avatar. I mean, we already had it in the animated series, so I, I wanna make sure that it gets in there in the live action. I keep pointing in that direction when I'm talking about the live action and over there when I'm talking about the animation. I don't know why. Next big overarching theme, redemption. redemption. It's obviously huge for Zuko. I mean, his whole story is a redemption arc and oh my gosh, it's such a good one. It, the map of it is really good. You can totally flesh it out, but I would say Zuko's pacing throughout the entire series might have been the closest to uh, what would work in live action out of everybody's. It, his was the most mature pl uh, character development line, but it still could be fleshed out more. Anyway, uh, talk about that in the character arcs, but honesty and forgiveness are two of the big sub themes under this one for the Aang and Katara and Sokka group. Uh, we, I, I brought it up a bunch of times, but it, it was such a big part, I think, that we see that Aang messes up and Katara and Sokka forgive him. Uh, he fesses up too, and he he is punished for fessing up, but it's a knee-jerk reaction. And then we see that they, you know, get over the, the reaction and they know he needs them. They forgive him for this. And oh my gosh, do I want to talk about honesty and especially forgiveness when we get to season three, but we'll have to wait until we get to season three. I would classify under the redemption theme, accepting defeat with grace. And I'm mentioning this because I think this is actually really important to Zhao and, uh, and Zuko in season one because it, it shows the difference between the two of them. They're both determined to capture the Avatar. They both use questionable means at different times in order to catch the Avatar. But when faced against each other, Zhao acts without honor, trying to attack Zuko in defeat, not accepting his defeat in grace, and Zuko does not kill him or maim him, well, maim him, you know, disfigure him with a burn like, you know, Zuko was. Honestly, there are a lot of moments in season one that are the start of a redemption theme throughout the entire series. So we definitely have it for Zuko. We have him being beaten down a lot in season one, um, which is the ego being broken down. And only when the ego is broken down can his, the thing that's blocking him from even having a desire to redeem himself comes up. Like th that has to happen before he can recognize in himself that he needs to change. And in Aang's story, he abandoned his people in a moment of selfishness, looking to escape his responsibility to protect, of protecting the world. You know, he, even though he wasn't, at least in the animated series, he didn't seem to be aware that the world was super in danger. I mean, I know it was brought up, but you know, it's one of those things where you figure he wasn't fully aware of what the situation was because it wasn't there at his doorstep. He didn't see the Fire Nation coming in to attack. Um, it was just this thing that was told to him, like, you're going to save the world and it's your job and we have to prioritize preparing you to do that. And he just wanted to be a kid. And he runs away from that to 
have some peace, have some, you know, do his own thing for a little bit. I don't think he meant to run away forever, but he does. And it has a huge consequence. Everybody's dead. So now Aang, I think he is moving to moving towards his own redemption. It's a lot less obvious than Zuko's path. But, um, oh gosh, we're gonna have to talk about this in Aang's arc. I got way too many of these themes that I'm just gonna have to wait about or that I'm just gonna have to wait and talk about in the character arcs. But anyway, so Aang has his own redemption that he is seeking. He is going to accept his role as the Avatar and protect the Water Tribe from genocide, which is about to happen because waterbending is out. They cannot defend, you know, when we, when Zhao does his thing with, uh, you know, killing off Twi and eliminating the moon, the Water Tribe is essentially defenseless. And you know that he just wanted to blast everybody after that. So Aang is doing the thing for the Water Tribe that he didn't do for the Air Nomads. So there, that, that's that, that, that. That's the theme that we're going to be seeing here. And, you know, making sure that we see him struggling to accept that role, I think will feel very nice if we can see that, you know, see that it, it there's a progress being made from he was running away to now he's accepting this role. And a final overarching theme that I'm going to mention, even though, oh my gosh, there's so many I've had to leave out just because I can't, otherwise this video will be way too long, is the qualities of leadership. We see this come up so many times in the series, and it's woven into every single one of these main four characters, uh, Aang, Katara, Sokka, and Zuko. So for Aang, the qualities of leadership, obviously accepting that you have a gift that people need, you have a power to help people, and you should use it. Uh, this is actually a, a very controversial subject, is when you have power, when do you use it against other people? Is it just to protect other people? How far do you take that protection? Do you take it into offense? I mean, in the M. Night Shyamalan movie, that was actually a theme that I really liked. Uh, it was taking Aang and saying, you need to not just avoid, you know, defend yourself. You need to play offense as well. It's interesting because I don't know how this would have been carried into season two or into the second movie if that movie was got a sequel, because that seems to be a big block for him and earthbending, where he, he can't really earthbend because he always tries to dodge and get around. So I don't know how they would have it would have felt like backtracking if suddenly it was a problem again. But anyway, okay, no discussing that anymore. But anyway, uh, Katara. So Katara puts herself out there as a leader by being not afraid, unafraid of standing up and trying to help people. We see it in season three as the Painted Lady. But in season one, we see it a lot in the that Imprisoned episode where she puts herself out there to try to inspire people to, you know, take up arms and free yourself. Uh, we see that Katara's compassion is the driving force behind her leadership quality. So compassion as a leadership quality exemplified through Katara and bravery too. In Zuko's story, we see him putting the needs of others above his wants. Um, and we, we kind of touched on that in, in some of the other themes, so I'm not gonna go too much into that, but the time that I enjoyed seeing this the most was when he, in the storm, he acted as part of the crew and you know put the lives of the crew ahead of pursuing the Avatar. Um, and we saw a couple times where he did that and it was less obvious, but there it was like, it was a standout moment. Now, the character who has the most interesting exploration of this leadership theme is Sokka. I, gosh, I love his arc. It's so underrated. He is a leader at heart and doesn't know it. He has all the qualities of leadership. We saw Valor in the beginning when he stood up to the Fire Navy, the Fire Nation ship 
coming towards him. He has a sense of what's right and wrong, and he's willing to put aside his own impressions of people to do what's right when he stands up to Jet. He isn't taken in by charisma. I mean, he is briefly for a moment, but he sees through it right away. And then he has that instinct to protect. We see him wanting to be the protector in the, the Southern Water Tribe, and then he protects the gang on their whole journey. And this is what a leader does. They protect the group. They protect the people. And if they're not doing that and they're doing things that put everybody at risk, they're not a good leader. So his protector role, his instinct to protect is one of his greatest leadership qualities because he will do what will protect the gang. We also see that he has the humility to see when he is maybe wrong about something and that opens his mind to um, outside perspectives so necessary to making a wise choice. He's got such an underrated story arc. I really hope like <laughs> Uh, I really hope we see more exploration of his arc because he's got to be one of my favorite characters. I, I know people ask me, who are your favorite characters? And I go, well, I mean, I love them all, really love them all. But if I was going to have a top three, it would be Iroh, Zuko, and Sokka. And it's because of Sokka's journey to becoming a leader. But um, his leadership qualities should be emerging or we should be seeing evidence of them throughout the first season. Also problem solving when he's working with the mechanist. So to see all of this emerging from Sokka in season one, all of this, these, these leadership qualities, the, the, the sparks of them are being ignited in season one. I, I think that will be necessary to put in there too. Okay, I promised myself I wouldn't tag on another theme after I recorded this video in person, but I have to because this one is important. And it's a character and plot related theme, but also a stylistic theme. And that is childlike innocence. We really see this exemplified in Aang and his relationship with Katara and Sokka, and later with Toph. Anytime they're doing anything that isn't related directly to we have to win the war, we're gonna see their childlike innocence be touched on. The playfulness and the carefree life of being innocent is so beautiful, and we do see it throughout this show. The show becomes more serious towards the end, but that's kind of a natural flow. Now, stylistically, we see this theme, or we hear it rather, in the music. There is a music box lullaby that plays repeatedly throughout the entire series, and it is the theme of the children, especially after a long, hard day, something that was stressful, or something that was exciting and adventurous. It is a quiet, beautiful melody. I would love to hear an homage to this somewhere in the live action. And it doesn't have to be a music box lullaby. It can be just in a melody that exemplifies childlike innocence. Anyway, I'm not going to expound on that anymore. There are a whole bunch of other sub themes that are less overarching, but they do come up throughout the series. And I just don't have time to talk about them in this video without it becoming a super long video. Like we have um, sexism, protection of nature, respect for a uh, culture the nuances in cultures. But anyway, as I said, I have to end this video because I just can't keep going on forever even though I could uh, and have two times before this. But let me know what you think are some themes you would love to see in the live action adaptation and maybe how you would integrate them in ways that are necessary or that we're seeing as part of the necessary plots, you know, the necessary character arcs and the overall plot. And yeah, um, anyway, so uh, my next video to come out will be on tones. So please like, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications. If you're feeling super generous, check out my Patreon or Ko-fi or hit the Money Heart Thanks button down below and be good to yourself. Yourself.